Oh, bless the name of the Lord. Thank you, Brother Tony, team. I want you to take your copy of God's Word and uh, make your way to Genesis. Hey, uh, listen, uh, y'all want to practice something for real quick? Good. Let's practice. Let's pretend, because this really is what, what Sundays are about in a large part. They're, you know, their practice runs for when we get to heaven. Do y'all know that? Yeah. So let's just pretend for a moment that we're already in heaven. Okay? Amen. That's good. Woohoo! Amen. Now, the Bible says there's neither night nor day nor time. <laughs> Woo! Amen. Take your copy of God's Word and go to Genesis chapter 12. And as you make your way to the 12th chapter of Genesis, let me set the tenor and the tone for the text and what we're going to be unpacking for just a few moments. We have, uh, uh, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we've dedicated the day to uh, revisiting and renewing our hearts toward the mission and the vision that God's given us here at Fairview. And now our mission uh, is what's going to make the outline of this morning's uh, message. Tonight, I'm going to be going back. We're going to revisit Isaiah 54, 2. And uh, that's, our, that's the template of biblical truth that we take apart um, for where we're headed. And you'll see that tonight. There's a very, very important announcement coming tonight. I desperately need you to be in your place um, as we uh, uh, unpack what God's doing in our midst. So let's do this. I want you to find Genesis chapter 12, and I want you to stand out of reverence for the reading of God's holy, infallible, inerrant, and authoritative word. And then we're going to pray a prayer. Back a number of years ago, the people that I um, was leading, the Lord began to um, do a work in my heart, and for some reason, He was constantly impressing me to lead us to pray this prayer. And, and of late, um, He's done the same thing here. And I think it's a harbinger. I think it's an indicator that the, the work is, is just moving to a deeper level of what's going on in our hearts. This is a promise from the Word of God. If you pray the Word of God, you cannot go wrong. It, it is a check that you can take to the very uh, bank window of glory. So we're going to pray this together. Let's, let's do it together. Read outside. We're going to pray it together. Lord, open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Father, we've prayed this by faith, and we believe that your word will not return void. So we have declared our greatest desire this morning is not to hear from a man, but from you. So, Father, remove any spirit that's not of the Holy Spirit, Every care and concern that would in any way hinder the going forth and the work of your Holy Spirit. Open our eyes that we may see the wondrous things of your law. All God's people said, don't be seated. Stay right where you are. We're going to read the word, okay? <laughs> I throw you all off on purpose. Now look at verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thee a great name. Make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I'll bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. You may be seated, beloved. Now, here's what we're going to do real quick. We're going to take apart our mission statement. It, you'll see it uh, on different things around here. Sometimes you'll see it on a, a wristband. And sometimes there's a, there's a little bit of a mistake that it's, it's perhaps just a, a pithy little saying or perhaps just a cute little motto. It is so much more than that. And it's not just for, it's not just about the church staff and, and those that labor at the church. It's not just a daily truth for us. It's, it permeates the body. It's part of who we are. We have committed before the Lord under the leadership of His Holy Spirit to remain focused, to operate fearlessly, and to move forward. So I'm going to unpack, I think, one of the greatest biblical examples there is in, in the life of Abraham. We're going to talk about what it means to be focused. Now, I want you to look at verse 1 one more time and, and notice the flow in, of the text, but notice the tense of the text. Now, the Lord had said unto Abram. Now, how many of you realize that if it said had, that means he already has, right? It's past tense. 
Now, we know that he already has because if you go to line upon line, precept upon precept, Acts chapter 7 tells us that the, that the Lord had already spoken to Abram while he was in Haran. We know that if you back up and go into chapter 11, which we're about to do in a moment, that he's already been speaking. That's why it's past tense. The Lord had spoken to Abram. So here's my question when we're dealing with the threefold principle of, of a body of believers that have committed to be focused, to operate fearlessly, and to move forward. What was it that got in Abram's way? Now, now I want you for a moment to just imagine that you have heard from God. I mean, God spoke to you. God so spoke to you that he gave definitively, not only did he give a plan for you to follow, but a promise for you to claim. Can you imagine this morning for just a moment, if your phone were to light up and it were to say, the White House of the United States, or if you got a text that said, Dear sir, ma'am, you're about to get a phone call from the President of the United States. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, please get to where you can go to receive this call. How many would text back and say, check me out later, Don? <laughs> You'd probably get up and take the call, right? Oh, you wouldn't? I'd stop preaching and take the call. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, now, here's what's amazing. Here's a man that's living in a culture that's steeped in idolatry, overwhelmed with demonic activity. It is a plethora. It's, 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 it is a, it, it, it's God's everywhere that have saturated demonically. He's living in Or the Chaldees. We know that it's a pagan place because the book of Joshua says that Terah, his dad, worshipped foreign or false gods that were not gods on the other side of the river. So, so we know all about that. My question is this, what stopped the focus in Abram's life from following God? I mean, if you got a word from God, would you not move heaven and earth to do it? Oh, before you answer that, I, gotta, I, gotta, I, I almost forgot something. That's kind of what happens every week here. That's kind of what happens every time you go to your praise, private praise and prayer time that's kind of what happens every time we go to our secret place. Does he not speak to us today? Is, is his ear deaf that he cannot hear us? Is his arm shortened that he cannot reach us? Does he not? Have you not been in this room, beloved, unless you're a visitor for the first time or two? Have you not been in this room when the wind of God was blowing and the Spirit was moving and the Spirit of God was speaking? Do you know how many Sundays the sovereign God of eternity peeks over the balcony of glory and sends the Holy Ghost of God to stir a heart, to move a saint, to speak a word, and we yawn and go, I tell you, he's pumped today. We're going to be here a while. How many times that happens in this room? How do we lose our focus? What is it that distracts us and detours us? We're the church of the living God. How is it that we lose sight of his sovereign call? Well, I, I, have, I have three suggestions I'm going to give you this morning. I have three very quick suggestions, um, and, and we'll move quickly through. Number one, I, I, I think one of the first things that we deal with is we're so busy with the urgent, we just never get to the important. Is it not amazing, beloved, we live in a day and time when we've got more time-saving devices than we've ever had and we've got less time than we've ever known? <laughs> Isn't that the truth? My great-grandparents, to my knowledge, did not own a car, did not have plumbing until I was a child, and they had time to enjoy life. We've got, some, we've got gadgets and gizmos and we got nuclear reactors in our, in our kitchen. That instead of baking a biscuit, just throw that thing in there and nuke it. Don't worry about if it's hot and takes the top of your mouth off. The next bite will be ice cold and it'll help you. <laughs> Amen? I think part of what happened with Abram is he got so busy with the urgent that he never got to the important. Now, now I, I will admit to you there's a little bit of conjecture. There's a little bit of sanctified imagination in this. But if, if you read chapter 11, verses 27 through 32, this is, this is a summary of it. Abram could have easily said to the Lord, Look, my dad's getting old. Haran is sick because we're going to find out that, that Haran's going to die and he's going to leave a nephew named Lot. So, so just stay with me for just a moment. Just stay with me for a moment. 
Preacher, I, I, I understand you want us to be focused, but you don't understand. God, I know that you've got a call on my life, and you want me to leave Ur Chaldees, but my dad's getting on up in years, and my, my brother is sick, and he's got this crazy boy named Lot, and then i got to marry my half-sister, who I can't tell anybody's my half-sister until I tell them that she's my sister, which is really not my whole sister, but in order for her to not get me killed, i got to tell them that it's not my wife. And if you read your Bible, you'd have got all of that. So he's so busy, he's so busy saying, look, God, I've got a thousand. Dad's getting dementia. Haran's got the sickness. Lot is going into teenage years. And, and you know, you know if you've had to raise teenagers. I mean, I'm, I am absolutely 100% with the man that said when they turn 12, stick them in a barrel, seal the barrel, drill a hole, feed them through the hole, let them out when they're 20. He's so busy with the urgent, he just never gets to the and, he, and it, listen, this is legitimate. I mean, if you look at his life and don't just study this, some benign, anemic, theological trivia. I mean, get in there and, and hang out with him for a moment. Don't make him a hero you can't touch. It, he, he's got legitimate reasons. And, and when you hear him talk about the sickness of his brother and the aging of his dad and, and, and all that, and my, my wife, you know, we're praying for a kid. We don't have a kid. I can't leave home till she's pregnant. You know what amazes me, beloved, is we act sometimes like God doesn't know any of this. Y'all ever met anybody that didn't know they didn't know? <laughs> don't, don't point. Please do not point. Y'all ever met anybody that just didn't know they didn't know? And in the middle of not knowing, they want to share with you their ignorance. <laughs> I was pastoring a church one time, and I had the sorriest staff ever born in humanity. I'm telling you, they were ain't none of them going to heaven, I'm sure of that. Anyway... And they were all wadded up, and, and, and somebody asked me, what are they doing? I said, they're sharing their ignorance. They don't even know that they don't know. Now, here's what happens. We act like God doesn't know all of that stuff when we tell God why we can't do what he's called us to do. Do you do know, beloved, God's never got up one morning and ever looked over the balcony glory and said, I didn't see that coming. Do you all know that? Adrian Rogers, who died 12 years ago this week, this past week. I miss him every day. He said, has it ever occurred to you that nothing's ever occurred to God? But what happens is we, we get so busy with the urgent, we miss the important, and we'll make a hundred different excuses. And in the middle of it, we'll miss the Holy Ghost of God. Number two, we settle, we settle for good when God's trying to give us his best. Now, I, I don't know if you know this, but if you were to research Ur of the Chaldees, it's down on the Persian Gulf. It's an oasis right in the middle of an Arabian desert. It is absolutely overwhelming. Well, you know, we tend to take our picture of Bible characters from um, not-so-sanctified people. <laughs> We tend to think that they were cavemen, you know, dragging Sarah behind. He looks like Fred Flintstone. They're going to have Bron brontosaurus burgers, and he's beating her up. And we tend to think they were just Neanderthals. But if you were to study Mesopotamia, if you were to study specifically Irv Chaldees, this is what you would discover. I was reminded this week. I, I was just blown away. It is absolutely one of the most developed communities in all of its time. In fact, what is happening about the time we know from history of Abram is it, it, it's right on the Persian Gulf, which flows right into the Indian Ocean. Their ships are absolutely bulging with both goods and grains. They are in an economic heyday. The stock market, if they had it, was over 25000 They were known for their ability with metals and precious gems. They made some of the most glorious garments that had ever been put on the backs of humanity. In fact, I, I, I discovered this week, they were so good mathematically that there are today a dedicated group of professors who still study the mathematic equations of those in the Ur Chaldees because they cannot solve them. These are not some bumpkin rogue operating morons with, that, that don't know what they're doing. In fact, listen, he, this is what he would say. He would say, now God, I, wait, 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 wait a minute. Hold on. You want me to follow you to a place I, that you won't tell me. You want me to leave an oasis in, 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 in the middle of a dry, thirsty land. God, I, I, I'm hooked up here. I know everybody. My daddy's 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 people. <laughs> That he couldn't go that far back. If you read your Bible, you'd get that. But anyway, I know everybody. 
God, I could stay here and I, I could, I, listen, it's a boom in the economy. It would underwrite our ministry. Oftentimes, when the Spirit of God is moving us from good, it's, it, it, it is because He did not die to give us the good. He died and was resurrected to bring us the best. And arguing with God and telling God why he doesn't know is never, ever a good thing. Ever. Even if it doesn't make sense on paper. I'm telling you, there's times when the good gets in the way of the best. Now, number three, very quickly. We, we tend to choose the familiar over being faithful. His whole identity is tied up in we, we don't understand this necessarily in America because we've destroyed the home and we've disintegrated the family and redefined what all that means. But his whole identity was he was in the house of terror. In fact, let me tell you how they lived. He would have built a, a, a place onto his dad's, and he and Sarah would have lived there on the farm with dad, and they would have just kept expanding. I, I'm going to tell you something that reminds me. Chris and I were up in Pennsylvania, uh, Amish country, a couple of weeks ago ministering the Word of God, and there are literally generations upon generations upon generations living in these sprawling, unbelievable country homes with no electricity. Okay, it's Thanksgiving. Y'all can thank God you were not born Amish. So his whole identity is with the familiar. In fact, beloved, if you look at this word, do you know the root of the word familiar? It's family. Wait a minute, God, do you mean to tell me you want me to leave my family? Let me say it the way the New Testament says it. You can't serve two masters. You're either going to love the one or hate the other. Jesus said, I'll tell you something, and we don't know how to deal with this in the American culture. Unless you hate your mom and dad, you're not worthy. Now, he's not talking about disrespecting and hating. What he's saying is, unless your love and dedication to me if it, when you compare and contrast it to your love and dedication to your family, unless it makes it look like you're willing to walk off from them, you're not willing to follow. Now, I'm going to tell you, American Christians have a hard time with that because we've created a, such a culture of comfort that we don't know what to do when God tells us to leave the familiar in order to be faithful. And I'm telling you, I've served a, a lot of people over the years, and I've, I've met a lot of guys, a lot of girls, that had the call of God on their life, but they wouldn't follow God across the county line. And today, their lives are nowhere near what they could have been because they believed God called them, and they wouldn't go past the zip code. And what God had for them beyond, just beyond the border, they never got to realize. Y'all all right? So part of what happens is we lose our focus, and those are three very profound reasons. Now, I need to preface what I'm about to say as we move through this quickly because our next, our next component is called fearless. Now, here's the issue. I need to share some things with you, beloved, and I'm not being a pessimist. I'm not trying to put you under burden. It's Thanksgiving weekend, and I, or Thanksgiving week we're going into. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, to be doom and gloom. But I, I, am, I am trying to help you understand where we live prophetically in these last days. Part of the reason the Church of America is losing her focus, let me give an example. There will be 17 Southern Baptist churches close their doors today. There were 17 on average last week, 17 next week. And the only reason there's not more than that is because there are some churches that are drying up at the root, but they robbed God for years and put the money in a CD instead of the ministry. And they're living off money they stole from God. And they're meaner than half-yard, crazy, rabid yard dogs. They're just mean. And they ain't going to change. They've got buildings sitting right in the middle of a transitional area ethnically where African Americans or Hispanics or some group could come in and help them build a great soul-winning church. That ain't my people. Don't look like me. I ain't giving them nothing. And they've lost their focus. And can't nobody pastor them. Because they know the bylaws better than they do the Bible. So what happens is they start responding in fear. Now, I'm going to say something to you that's going to be heavy. I've already said that, but I just need you to hear what I'm saying. I need you to look at verse 30. Um, uh, 20, no, no, look at verse 27. It's there on the screen. I had it wrong last time. I had a verse that wasn't in there. Look at verse 27. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begot Lot. 
And Haran died before his father, Terah, in the land of his nativity. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. Uh, the name of Abram's wife was Sarah. Now, now look at verse 31. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his uh, son's son. Now, here's the problem. When we lose our focus, we, we no longer are able to operate in faith. And because we're not able to operate in faith, because this is what we've done, we've rationalized it. I, I, I've said to God, now wait a minute, God, I, I, let, let, let me, can, I'm going to put it in New Testament terms one more time. Let me go bury my father. <laughs> well, the problem was his dad hadn't even died yet. If you, if you research that out in the New Testament, his dad wasn't even dead yet. You know what Jesus said? Let the dead bury the, the dead. Yeah. Let the Baptist bury the Baptist. That's a loose translation. You understand what I'm saying? So you, you lose your focus. Well, now you respond in fear. Oh, my gosh. You want me to do what? You want me to leave who? You want, you want what? I, I can't do this. So this is what he does. He compromises. Do you know what a compromise is? A compromise is when two parties come together and agree on what neither one of them needed. That's a compromise. Almost, let me say it this way. Delayed obedience is disobedience. You don't debate with God. You, listen, one year ago last week, your pastor, uh, three years ago last week, your pastor search team came over the mountain to East Campus and, and walked in. Did I say that right? Look at me, baby. Look at me. Did I say that right? Look at me. Did I say that right? Three years ago, came over the mountain, walked in the back of a church that w was exploding with the power of God, getting ready, just bought an unbelievable piece of, of property at the end of a major, major, unbelievable whole world's moving there, piece of property we just paid for it, and, and walked in, and the Holy Ghost said, you're moving. I may tell you, not because we're anything special, not because we're super natural, spiritual. Let me, let me explain something to you. We just said to God, okay, because we've learned something. It's always best to go with him than to stay and to compromise regardless. Why did Tara go? Why is he, he said, wait, 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 wait. He said in chapter 12, leave your family Leave your father, leave your country. You get to chapter 11, which precedes, you know, obviously, and it says, and Tara took them. <laughs> Tara? Tara wasn't even supposed to be going. Listen to me, beloved. I'm going to say something to you. It's going to be tough to hear. There are some things in our lives that are not necessarily bad, but they, if we take them with us when God says to leave them, we will, they will cause us trouble the rest of our lives. Brother Jeff, that, that, that friend's not a bad person. I didn't say that friend was a bad person. But that friend's always going to tell you it makes no sense for you to leave the familiar. It makes no sense for you to take care of the important. It makes no sense for you to walk by faith. And that friend it, it will say, you can't do this. You've got a 401K. <laughs> I know. But where I'm going, the retirement's out of this world. <laughs> Boy, I love it. It takes some of y'all an hour and a half to watch 60 minutes. <laughs> Tara, what, 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 what's he doing? Oh, by the way, the word Tara, the name Tara, it means to delay. It means to detour. We are living in a culture, beloved, that is absolutely, we, we live in a post-Christian nation i got to share some things with you that are going to be hard to hear. But because we are sometimes guilty of living in our own little stained glass bubble, we get taken off guard that the whole world, and I'm going to say this respectfully, but it's gone to hell in a handbasket. Amen? I don't mean that crudely. I, I, it reminds me of the young seminary preacher that just got out of seminary, earned his master's degree, <laughs> took a little small church, and son, he was so tickled, he couldn't believe he had his own pulpit to preach in. He got up there one Sunday morning, son, he got to ripping. He's preaching on hell hot and heaven sweet and the devil mean. And he just tore off on the devil. He said, I want you to know he's a low down, no good. I mean, he just weaved a whole line of stuff what the devil was. And right in the middle of it, he don't even know why, he called the devil a bad word. <laughs> right in the middle of it. Called, just said it out loud in his sermon. He just stopped. He said, I can't believe I said that. 
It was his first church on his first Sunday after earning his seminary degree. He was so absolutely overwhelmed and discouraged. He just walked out the side door of the church, went out and sat down on a tombstone in the cemetery at the church. He just sat down and he said, I can't believe I just said, I just called the devil a, dirt, a cuss word right in the middle of my sermon. He was just crying, I know they're going to fire me. I ain't never going to get another church. About that time, the chairman of deacons came out and said, son, said, while you walked out, said, uh, we, we, we had a business meeting. <laughs> he said, we know you called the devil an S.O. <laughs> he said, I want you to know, we shocked. But said, we had a business meeting, and we voted, and we agree, he is. You can come back. <laughs> What that has to do with anything, I don't know. But listen to me. <laughs> the church is oftentimes the last to figure out how quickly things are changing. Now, I know that this is politically incorrect, and it's, it's, it's absolutely a, a lightning rod for me to say this, but I, I'm telling you, this nation was founded as a Christian nation. It, it, if you've never studied our history... I'm telling you, there's two things most Americans don't know today. Number one, it was the providence of God that brought us here. There's almost absolutely irrefutable evidence that Christopher Columbus was a Jew. If you, if you trace the time that he, that he came looking for the land, it was in the middle of Isabella's Inquisition when they were killing Jews in the millions. He was looking for a place for his people to go. It was by the providence of God. In fact, this nation would not exist today had it not been for two Jewish men who underwrote the Revolutionary War. We were broke and couldn't buy a musket. And it was two Jews that God put together that were millionaires in that day that funded the war. And that's the only reason we're not living under the queen today. Amen? So I know what I'm about to say is very charged politically. And if you're visiting, <laughs> we've already got your visitor's card, so suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> it's amazing. It just comes out. I don't know where it comes from. We are a post-Christian nation. Post-Christian. Brother Jeff, how do you know that? I'm, I want you to listen. Listen to this. This is, this, is, this is what I call the public shift in tolerance. We, Christianity is no longer tolerated. It's no longer tolerated. It's now being persecuted. I want you to listen to this. May of 2014, a California pastor was arrested for reading the Bible in public. July of 2011, Christian ministers were arrested for praying near a, home, near, near a homosexual festival. In 2015, Christians were arrested for sharing the gospel near, not at, near a Muslim gathering in Deer, Dearborn, Michigan. That we're not being tolerated anymore, we're being persecuted. I want you to listen to the shift in education. In 2011, the Commission on Higher, Commis uh, the Commission on Higher Education released their report in a formal survey of American sociologists and educators and stated they would be less likely, highly less likely to hire a job candidate who is a professing believer. If you don't believe that, here, here, listen, I'm not cherry picking. I'm, I'm not playing on your emotions. I'm trying to get you to understand if we don't stay focused, if we don't stay focused, we're going to miss God's call. Dr. Martin um, Gaskell, who's one of the most esteemed lauded astronomers in, in his field, recently lost his job offer. The University of Kentucky wooed him away from another university to ask him to come run the department. He, the job offer was re removed, rescinded, after a board member learned that Dr. Gas Gaskell was, now I quote, potentially a Christian and therefore unfit to be at the University of Kentucky. Now, Brother Jeff, that, you're cherry picking. That's, that's, just, that's just ridiculous. Okay, wait, 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 wait a minute. A recent study conducted by Community Research Group discovered that less than one in four educators um, have negative feelings toward Muslims. Less than 25% have negative feelings or fear Muslims. 
but an overwhelming majority, somewhere in the 70 percentile, indicated that they have very negative feelings and are scared of Christians. This is post 9 11. I don't think that was Christians driving those planes into those towers. I don't think that was fundamentalist believers, Christians that drove that plane into the Pentagon. That, that, that's, that's not Allah Akbar that's running across our armed forces bases and killing our men and women. And you, that's, not, that's not Southern Baptist, but educators who've been indoctrinated from the university. Emily Brooker, a student of Missouri State University, as a part of a class she was assigned to take, was required to sign a letter in her undergraduate studies class which was composed by the entire class which simply stated that they supported same-sex child adoption rights. They were to sign the letter, and the letter was going to be sent to Missouri state legislators. Emily was brought before a public discrimination commission and faculty members and students and was publicly excoriated because she was a bigoted, demo, uh, bigoted discriminating Christian. Mm. The American Psychiatric Association has recently in their Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, that's DSM, some of you are in it. <laughs> oh, wait, I ain't done. I'm telling you, you're there. I, I'm, I'm the poster child. Listen to this. The American, the APA, American Psychiatric Association, has recently moved to adopt in their DSM. They are moving to classify, and I quote, racism, sexism, and homophobia as a diagnostic mental disorder called intolerant personality disorder. Y'all met you, Pastor? I got me a big old heap of that. This means that at some point, the APA under DSM guidelines will begin to help the United States government identify those who are, are Christians who believe that homosexuality is a sin because they will be classified with a mental dis disorder, no longer capable of raising their own children, holding jobs, or operating in public without medication. Boy, they'll have a big time at the Fairview. <laughs> Amen. I don't think they make that many pills for this crowd. <laughs> the governor of California one year ago signed a bill, SB 1172, into law which makes it illegal for any counselor or family therapist in the state of California to counsel any minor that homosexuality is wrong. They are to be jailed and their license are to be revoked if at any time even the parents, even if the, and here's the motivation behind the bill. Christian parents were bringing their, their sons and daughters who were dealing with their sexual identity to, to therapists. And the governor said, if a Christian parent brings their child to be counseled that homosexuality is wrong, the parent is to be jailed and the counselor is to tell the child there's nothing wrong with them. Even if the kid wants help. That's a law. Jack Phillips, a baker in Colorado, is currently being forced to appear before the Colorado Human Rights Commission. He's currently bankrupt, losing his home. He's being brought up on charges and has been found guilty of homophobia because he refused to bake a wedding cake as a believer for two men. Photographers in New Mexico were stunned recently when the Mexico State Supreme Court ruled, and I quote, you do not have the right, regardless of your Christian beliefs, to refuse to take pictures, to take photographs for anybody. Your biblical convictions do not, do not allow you to not do public commerce, regardless of how you feel about someone's sexuality. The bathroom bills recently been been passed. Transgenders, transracials, transracials. That, that's a new thing. You can wake up in the morning and feel Filipino. That's why Jeff and I, that's why they constantly think we're brothers. I'm all the time. People are stopping me and say, Scarborough. Oh, man, that's a pastor. Because me and Scarborough look just alike because I'm feeling my Filipino. You understand what I'm saying? 
Uh, listen, I'm not trying to be a De- Debbie Downer. I'm, I'm just saying to you, I- I'm, I'm begging you to hear what I'm saying to you. You've got to understand that we do not live in a Christian nation anymore. If there's ever been a time when we're supposed to be salt and light, if there's ever been a day, ever been a day, when, when, when Adrian Rogers would say it this way, he said, boys, <laughs> the darker it gets out there, the brighter our light will shine. Listen, I'm I'm not down. I'm not telling you that we're done. I'm telling you that our greatest day is here. I'm talking, listen to me, listen. I know this is going to offend some of you. I understand that. But the day of complacent, mealy mouth, weak knee, backbiting, complaining, bylaw toting, business meeting having, all the time, Brother Jeff, there's our children and the praise school wife and buggers on the wall. They're writing buggers on the wall. They're putting buggers. Well, for the love of God, you've been asking for a ministry. Get you some lights on, wipe them buggers in Jesus' name. Get yourself down there. Do you understand what I'm saying? What's wrong with you? You've asked God and there's a big green sign on that wall. Booger, get it. (laughs) There's a shift. There's a shift. And it's here. It's not coming. It's here. And listen to me. If we do not stay focused and keep the main thing the main thing, if we do not operate fearless and go in faith, we will never get to go forward. And I'm going to prove this to you biblically because here's what happens. What happens in, 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 in his life is the text says they left Ur and they went up to Haran. Now, Haran's a mountain. That's mountain country. How many of you know sometimes it takes a mountain? Sometimes God's got to put something right, right up, I mean, just right up in front of you to say, wait, wait, wait a minute. Hold on. By the way, the word Haran, it means desolate place, dry place. You, you, Ain't no power in your private praise and prayer time. Ain't no spirit in your secret place. I'm telling you, the word used to pop up off that page. You used to get your harp in the spirit. You used to sing in the Holy Ghost. But now there's no power. There's no presence. It's just vain religious rut. You're just dying and drying up on the vine. Why? Because when God called you up out of earth, you compromised and said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go halfway. And that's what that is. Haran's halfway. It's halfway to where God wants you. And we'll say it again. Delayed obedience is disobedience. And sometimes, beloved, God will purposely move you into the face of a mountain. I feel it in my spirit. You feel it in your spirit, baby? You feel it in your spirit? Come on, let's do it. We, we've been singing this song all over our house. Can we sing for y'all for a minute? Say yes, I'm going to do it. Come on, baby. Come here. This, been, this, this song is really what started this sermon. And we've been singing this. Well, I've been singing it. <laughs> you, can you start me? Let's do it. This, this, a good, this is a good word here. Y'all, don't listen to the way we sing it. <laughs> can you do it? Sometimes it takes a mountain. You start. Sometimes it takes a sea. Sometimes it takes a desert. Hold of me. Your love is, is so much stronger than whatever I face. You sing it for me. I don't know. You don't know? I don't know what you're singing. Okay, sit down. If you're watching online, that's Loretta Lynn. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a mountain. Sometimes it troubled sea. Come on, brother Tony. Yeah, that's why you let the music guy do the music. Oftentimes when we get to Haran, we, we, we feel comfortable because we feel like we've gone far enough. And the problem is because we've not gone the whole way, we'll start picking other people apart that are going on with God because we're uncomfortable with the fact that we're comfortable in Haran. Now, I'm, I'm, I want you to, I'm, I'm about done. I want you to listen to me. 
If I lose my focus, what's going to happen is I'm not going to operate in faith. And what's going to move in is a spirit of fear. And once that spirit of fear takes over, I'm telling you, everybody and everything in the world will have you convinced that you can't trust God. And what will happen is you, you'll move a little bit with God, but you'll find a place and you'll stop. And you won't go on with God. And, and inevitably, when you get in Haran, which is a dry place, in fact, the text says that's where Terah died. Now, I'm going to make a very bold statement here. But I believe, biblically, there's enough evidence to say this. There are times when God has to remove from our lives what's keeping us from going on with Him. I'm just telling you. I, I, I can't tell you the people we've counseled over the years. I, I, I mean, of, of late, I can't tell you the people. They know they're in a wrong relationship. Now, I'm not talking about marriage. Don't you take this home. Well, the preacher said I could leave you. He said I could leave you. <laughs> I can hear it right now. Brother Jeff said you're my heron. Pack your stuff. <laughs> Are you hearing me? <laughs> I'm not talking about marriage. I'm talking about those of you that, that date. I, I can't tell you the people that have said to me, Brother Jeff, I love him, but he won't come to church and he's not a believer. Well, God didn't call you to be an evangelistic dater. Amen? Amen? Now, I know there's exceptions in this room, and by God's grace, you didn't get in the mess. You dated an unbeliever and got married to an unbeliever, and God's grace saved that believer. But listen to me, that's the exception. And you don't break the Word of God in order to honor God. You with me? Boy, it's tighter than Lulu Roman's girdle in this room right now. Good. Land's alive. Some of y'all look like the monkey kissed the skunk. Woo! He didn't get all he wanted, but he got all he could stand. Mm. I told y'all this is a tough word. But you're not going forward until you decide, I'm leaving Haran. Some of you ain't even got out of her yet. You're still down there rationalizing with God. You're still down there telling God, why it's better you stay in her. You could be a great evangelist in her. God doesn't want you in her. He's called you to a place. And, and listen, one of the reasons he didn't tell Abraham where they were going is because he didn't want Abraham more focused on the destination. He wanted Abraham focused on the relationship. Abram, I need you to be with me every day. And if I tell you where we're going, you'll put it in the GPS and you and that camel will be gone. And you'll miss everything i got for you. There's a world of people that have no clue what's coming to this nation. In fact, I'm, I'm going to tell you now, this, this is all personal opinion. I, I don't, this is just from research that I'm doing. I'm working on a major project for seminary right now. And part of, my, part of what I'm working on is out of this defense. I, I really believe that if there is not a revival in this nation, there is coming a day when it is going to be illegal to meet like we're meeting this morning. I and mean, that's how quick it, now I know some of you think, boy, preacher, that is totally off the chart. That is nothing but complete emotional fear. I'm, I'm, if you'll pay attention, if you'll pay attention to what's already here. And somebody said to me in Maryland when I was preaching, they said, now, Brother Jeff, we're a technological age. Our technology is going to bring this back. And I, now, I didn't have the wisdom to say this. The Holy Ghost gave me this. I asked them, well, if that's the case, then why, why is it that over 50% of all Internet traffic on cell phones is pornography? Technology does not change a culture. It just enhances what the culture wants. So now our men and women don't have to slip around to an adult bookstore and put it in a paper bag, they can sit in their home with their own personal device. Technology does not change the culture. It just reveals what a culture is already about. That's all. So, beloved, here's the bottom line. Do you all remember what they called Abraham? There's a little song. Now, I can't sing this one, Brother Tony. I can't sing this one. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had. you all know it? Come on. Your daddy. <laughs> Let me ask you something. Why did they call him Father Abraham? 
this is a dude who didn't have but one boy. Well, he had two, but we ain't going to talk about the other one right now. <laughs> he didn't have but one boy in the covenant. Why did they call him Father Abraham? Because he had many sons and many daughters. Now, listen to me. You and I are here today because there's a wild olive branch we've been grafted in. And God's grace, you know what God's grace has done? He took his covenant people that rejected his son and he, he grafted us into the promise. And do you know, you, you're going to hear me say this to the point of ad nauseum in 2018. 18, by the way, the Hebrew number 18 is bondage. Bondage. That'll bless you. <laughs> but wait a minute. Luke chapter 13, there was a woman that was in a physical bondage for 18 years. Guess what happened in the 18th year? Jesus set her free. Eglon held God's people captive for 18 years. Guess what happened in the 18th year? God set them free. Rehoboam had 18 wives. No, I ain't going to touch that. <laughs> you know what we got to have? You know what I'm begging God for for the next dimension in this church? Spiritual fathers. Spiritual fathers. Do you know how many young men out there that are this morning waking up they couldn't find it in the bottle. They couldn't find it in the bag. They're climbing out of a bed. They don't even know how they got there this morning. They don't have a clue. Everything they worked for for the last week or two was gone in one night of feeding the appetite of the flesh. And they're going to roll out of a bed this morning, and they're going to scratch their head and say, you know what? That bottle didn't help. That bag didn't help. This bed hadn't helped. There's got to be more. And I know what you're thinking. Well, Brother Jeff, I hope they come to Fairview. I do too. But you know what they need when they get to Fairview? They need some spiritual moms and dads. They need somebody that will come alongside of them and say, my father's faithful, and he can bring you out of bondage and set you free. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the sweet spirit in this room. My goodness gracious. I thank you, Lord, for the power of your word. It will not return void. And I'm so thankful that in the midst of all of this, oh, God, culture is disintegrating and our nation is fighting for her life that we've got this blessed hope in the gospel. So I pray for some men and women this morning who are going to hear the call of, of their heavenly father and he's going to say, hey, come on with me. And you've got some orphans that you're going to introduce them to. And they're going to pour their life into some young men and women and they're never going to be the same. Generational curses are going to be broken. Marriages are going to be saved. Homes are going to be rescued. Not because Fairview built a big building. Not because you had a stellar staff. But because you raised up some Abrahams who went forth. Didn't have any more sense and just follow God. So I pray for every weary, worn out, broken down soldier in this room. That this morning will be a renewed call. Because sometimes it does take a mountain. Sometimes a troubled sea. Sometimes a desert to get a hold of me. But oh God, how faithful you are. So speak.